Ulysses, Chapter 17, Part 1, by James Joyce. What parallel courses did Bloom and Stephen follow returning? Starting united at normal walking pace from Beresford Place, they followed in the order named Lower and Middle Gardner Streets and Mountjoy Square West. Then, at reduced pace, each bearing left Gardner's Place by an inadvertence as far as the farther corner of Temple Street, then north as far as Hardwick Place. Approaching disparate, at relaxed walking pace, they cross both the circus before George's church diametrically, the cord in any circle being less than the arc which it subtends. Of what the, the doomvirate deliberate during their itinerary. Music, literature, Ireland, Dublin, Paris, friendship, woman, prostitution, diet, the influence of gaslight, or the light of arc and glow lamps on the growth of adjoining paroheliotropic trees, exposed corporation emergency dust buckets, the Roman Catholic Church, ecclesiastical celibacy, the Irish nation, Jesuit education, careers, the study of medicine, the past day, the maleficent influence of the pre-Sabbath Stephen's collapse. Did Bloom discover common factors of similarity between their respective like and unlike reactions to experience? Both were sensitive to artistic impressions, musical in preference to plastic or pictorial, both preferred a continental to an insular manner of life, a cisatlantic to a transatlantic place of residence, both indurated by early domestic training and an inherited tenacity of heterodox resistance, professed their disbelief in many orthodox religious, national, social, and ethical doctrines. Both admitted the alternately stimulating and obtunding influence of heterosexual magnetism. Were their views on some points divergent? Stephen dissented openly from Bloom's views on the importance of dietary and civic self-help, while Bloom dissented tacitly from Stephen's views on the eternal affirmation of the spirit of man in literature. Bloom assented covertly to Stephen's rectification of the anachronism involved in assigning the date of the conversion of the Irish nation to Christianity from Judaism by Patrick, son of Calpornus, son of Potitus, son of Odysseus, sent by Pope Celestine I in the year 432, in the reign of Leary, to the year 260 or thereabouts, in the reign of Cormac Mac Art, 266 AD, suffocated by imperfect deglutition of ailment to gastric inanition, and certain chemical compounds of varying degrees of adulteration and alcoholic strength, accelerated by mental exertion, and the velocity of rapid circular motion in a relaxing atmosphere. Stephen attributed to the reapparition of matutinal cloud perceived by both from two different points of observation, Sandy Cove and Dublin, at first no bigger than a woman's hand. Was there one point on which their views were equal and negative? The influence of gaslight or electric light on the growth of adjoining paroheliotropic trees. Had Bloom discussed similar subjects during nocturnal perambulations in the past? In 1884, with Owen Goldberg and Cecil Turnbull at night on public thoroughfares between Longwood Avenue and Leonard's Corner and Leonard's Corner and Singe Street and Singe Street and Bloomfield Avenue. In 1885, with Percy Apton in the evenings, reclined against the wall between Gibraltar Villa and Bloomfield House in Crumlin, barony of the Upper Cross. In 1886, occasionally with casual acquaintances and prospective purchasers on doorsteps, in front parlors and third-class railway carriages of suburban lines, in 1888, frequently with Major Brian Tweedy and his daughter Miss Marion Tweedy, together and separately on the lounge in Matthew Dillon's house in Roundtown. Once in 1892 and once in 1893 with Julius Judah Mastiansky, 
on both occasions in the parlour of his, Bloom's, house in Lombard Street, West. What reflection concerning the irregular sequence of dates 1884, 1885, 1886, 1888, 1892, 1893, 1904 did Bloom make before their arrival at their destination? He reflected that the progressive extension of the field of individual development and experience was regressively accompanied by a restriction of the converse domain of the inter-individual relations. As in what ways? From inexistence to existence he came to many, and was as one received, existence with existence he was with any, as any with any. From existence to non-existence, gone he would be by all, as none perceived. What act did Bloom make on their arrival at their destination? At the house steps of the fourth of the equidifferent uneven numbers, number seven, Eccles House, he inserted his hand mechanically into the back pocket of his trousers to obtain his latch key. Was it there? It was in the corresponding pocket of the trousers which he had worn on the day, but one preceding. Why was he doubly irritated? Because he had forgotten and because he remembered that he had reminded himself twice not to forget. What were then the alternatives before the premeditatedly, respectively, and inadvertently keyless couple? To enter or not to enter? To knock or not to knock? Bloom's decision? A stratagem. Resting his feet on the dwarf wall, he climbed over the area railings, compressed his hat on his head, grasped two points at the lower union of rails and stiles, lowered his body gradually by its length of five feet nine inches and a half to within two feet ten inches of the area pavement, and allowed his body to move freely in space by separating himself from the railings and crouching in preparation for the impact of the fall. Did he fall? By his body's known weight of eleven stone and four pounds, in avoir du poids measure, as certified by the graduated machine for periodical self-weighing in the premises of Francis Friedman, pharmaceutical chemist of 19 Frederick Street North, on the last feast of the Ascension, to wit, the twelfth day of May of the bisextile year 1904 of the Christian era, Jewish era 5,000... 664, Mohammedan era 1322, Golden Number 5, EPAC 13, Solar Cycle 9, Dominical Letters C, B, Roman Indiction 2, Julian Period 6617, MCM, IV. Did he rise uninjured by concussion? Regaining new stable equilibrium, he rose uninjured, though concussed by the impact, raised the latch of the area door by the exertion of force at its freely moving flange, and by leverage of the first kind, applied at its fulcrum, gained retarded access to the kitchen through the subjacent scullery, ignited a lucifer match by friction, set free inflammable coal gas by turning on the vent cock, lit a high flame which, by regulating, he reduced to quiescent candescence, and lit finally a portable candle. What discreet succession of images did Stephen meanwhile perceive? Reclined against the area railings, he perceived through the transparent kitchen panes a man regulating a gas flame of 14 cp, a man lighting a candle of one CP, a man removing in turn each of his two boots, a man leaving the kitchen, holding a candle. Did the man reappear elsewhere? After a lapse of four minutes, the glimmer of his candle was discernible through the semi-transparent, semi-circular glass fanlight over the hall door. The hall door turned gradually on its hinges. In the open space of the doorway, the man reappeared without his hat, with his candle. Did Stephen obey his sign? Yes. Entering softly, he helped to close and chain the door, and followed softly along the hallway the man's back, and listed feet and lighted candle past a lighted crevice of doorway on the left, and carefully down a turning staircase of more than five steps into the kitchen of Bloom's house. What did Bloom do? 
He extinguished the candle by a sharp expiration of breath upon its flame, drew two spoon-seat deal chairs to the hearthstone, one for Stephen with its back to the area window, the other for himself when necessary, knelt on one knee, composed in the greater pyre of cross-laid, re tipped sticks and various colored papers and irregular polygons of best abram coal at twenty-one shillings a ton from the yard of messrs flower and macdonald of fourteen dolier street kindled it at three projecting points of paper with one ignited lucifer match thereby releasing the potential energy contained in the fuel by allowing its carbon and hydrogen elements to enter into free union with the oxygen of the air of what similar apparitions did Stephen think? Of others elsewhere in other times, who, kneeling on one knee or on two, had kindled fires for him, of Brother Michael, in the infirmary of the college, of the Society of Jesus, at Glongau's Woods, Salins, in the county of Kildare, of his father, Simon Dedalus, in an unfurnished room of his first residence in Dublin, number 13 Fitzgibbon Street, of his godmother, Miss Kate Morkin, in the house of her dying sister, Miss Julia Morkin, at 15 Usher's Island, of his aunt Sarah, wife of Richie Richard Goulding, in the kitchen of their lodgings at 62 Clan Brazel Street, of his mother Mary, wife of Simon Dedalus, in the kitchen of number 12 North Richmond Street, on the morning of the feast of St. Francis Xavier, 1898, of the Dean of Studies, Father Butt, in the Physics Theatre of University College, 16 Stevens Green North, of his sister Dilly, Delia, in his father's house in Cabra. What did Stephen see on raising his gaze to the height of a yard from the fire towards the opposite wall? Under a row of five coiled spring house bells, a curvilinear rope stretched between two holdfasts, athwart across the recess behind the chimney pier, from which hung four small sized square handkerchiefs, folded unattached consecutively in adjacent rectangles, and one pair of ladies' grey hose with lyle suspender tops and feet in their habitual position, clamped by three erect wooden pegs two at their outer extremities and the third at their point of junction. What did Bloom see on the range? On the right smaller hob, a blue enameled saucepan. On the left larger hob, a black iron kettle. What did Bloom do at the range? He removed the saucepan to the left hob, rose and carried the iron kettle to the sink in order to tap the current by turning the faucet to let it flow. Did it flow? Yes, from round wood reservoir in County Wicklow of a cubic capacity of 2,400 million gallons percolating through a subterranean aqueduct of filter mains of single and double pipage constructed at an initial plant cost of five pounds per linear yard by way of Dargle Rathdown, Glen of the Downs and Callow Hill to the 26-acre reservoir at Still Organ, a distance of 22 statute miles, and thence through a system of relieving tanks by a gradient of 250 feet to the city boundary at Eustace Bridge, Upper Leeson Street, though from prolonged summer drought and daily supply of 12.5 million gallons, the water had fallen below the sill of the overflow weir, for which reason the borough surveyor and waterworks engineer, Mr. Spencer Harty, C.E., on the instructions of the Waterworks Committee, had prohibited the use of municipal water for purposes other than those of consumption, envisaging the possibility of recourse being had to the impotable water of the Grand and Royal Canals, as in 1893. Particularly at the South Dublin Guardians, notwithstanding their ration of 15 gallons per day per pauper supplied through a six-inch meter, had been convicted of a wastage of 20,000 gallons per night by a reading of their meter on the affirmation of the law agent of the corporation, Mr. Ignatius Rice, solicitor, thereby acting to the detriment of another section of the public self-supporting taxpayer's solvent sound. What in water did Bloom, water lover, drawer of water, water carrier returning to the range admire? Its universality its democratic equality and constancy to its nature, 
in seeking its own level, its vastness in the ocean of Mercator's projection, its unplumbed profundity in the sundown trench of the Pacific exceeding 8,000 fathoms, the restlessness of its waves and surface particles visiting in turn all points of its seaboard, the independence of its units, the variability of states of sea, its hydrostatic quiescence and calm, its hydrokinetic turgidity in neap and spring tides, its subsidence after devastation, its sterility in the circumpolar ice caps, Arctic and Antarctic, its climactic and commercial significance, its preponderance of three to one over the dry land of the globe, its indisputable hegemony, extending in square leagues over all the region below the sub-equatorial tropic of Capricorn, the multi-secular stability of its primeval basin, its latuvifulvious bed, its capacity to dissolve and hold in solution all soluble substances, including billions of tons of the most precious metals, its slow erosions of peninsulas and downward-tending promontories, its alluvial deposits, its weight and volume and density, its imperturbability in lagoons and highland tarns, its gradation of colors in the torrid and temperate and frigid zones, its vehicular ramifications in continental lake-contained streams and confluent ocean-flowing rivers with their tributaries and transoceanic currents, Gulf Stream, North and South Equatorial Courses, its violence in sea quakes, water spouts, artesian wells, eruptions, torrents, eddies, freshets, spates, ground swells, watersheds, water partings, geysers, cataracts, whirlpools, maelstroms, inundations, deluges, cloud bursts, its vast circumterrestrial a horizontal curve, its secrecy in springs and latent humidity revealed by rabodomantic or hygrometric instruments and exemplified by the hole in the wall at Ashton Gate, saturation of air, distillation of dew, the simplicity of its composition, two constituent parts of hydrogen with one constituent part of oxygen, its healing virtues, its buoyancy in the waters of the Dead Sea, its persevering penetrativeness in runnels, gullies, inadequate dams, leaks on shipboard, its properties for cleansing, quenching thirst and fire, nourishing vegetation, its infallibility as paradigm and paragon, its metamorphosis as vapor, mist, cloud, rain, sleet, snow, hail, its strength in rigid hydrants, its variety of forms in lows and bays and gulfs and bites and guts and lagoons and atolls and archipelagos and sounds and fjords and minches and tidal estuaries and arms of sea, its solidity in glaciers, icebergs, ice flows, its docility in working hydraulic mill wheels, Turbines, dynamos, electric power stations, bleach works, tanneries, scutch mills, its utility in canals, rivers, if navigable, floating and graving docks, its potentiality derivable from harness tides or watercourses falling from level to level, its submarine fauna and flora, an acoustic, photophobe, numerically if not literally, the inhabitants of the globe, its ubiquity as constituting 90% of the human body, the noxiousness of its effluvia in lacustrine marshes, pestilential fins, faded flower water, stagnant pools in the waning moon. Having set the half-filled kettle on the now-burning coals, why did he return to the still-flowing tap? 
to wash his soiled hands with a partially consumed tablet of Barrington's lemon-flavoured soap, to which paper still adhered, bought thirteen hours previously for four pence and still unpaid for, in fresh, cold, never-changing, ever-changing water, and dry them face and hands in a long, red-bordered holland cloth passed over a wooden revolving roller. What reason did Stephen give for declining Bloom's offer? That he was a hydrophobe, hating partial contact by immersion or total by submersion in cold water, his last bath had been taking place in the month of October of the preceding year. Disliking the aqueous substance of glass and crystal, distrusting aquacities of thought and language. What impeded Bloom from giving Stephen counsel of hygiene and prophylactic to which should be added suggestions concerning a preliminary wetting of the head and contraction of the muscles with rapid splashing of face and neck and thoracic and epigastric region in case of sea or river bathing, the parts of the human anatomy most sensitive to cold being the nape, stomach, and thinner or sole of foot. The incompatibility of aquacity with the erratic originality of genius... What additional didactic counsels did he similarly express? Dietary. Concerning the respective percentage of protein and caloric energy in bacon, salt, ling, and butter, the absence of the former and the last named, and the abundance of the latter and the first named. Which seemed to the host to be the predominant qualities of his guest? Confidence in himself, an equal and opposite power of abandonment and recuperation. What concomitant phenomenon took place in the vessel of liquid by the agency of fire? The phenomenon of ebullition, fanned by a constant updraught of ventilation between the kitchen and the chimney flue, ignition was communicated from the faggots of pre-combustal fuel to polyhedral masses of bituminous coal containing in compressed mineral form the foliated fossilized decidua of primeval forests which had in turn derived their vegetative existence from the sun, primal source of heat, radiant, transmitted through omnipresent luminiferous diathermanus ether heat convected a mode of motion developed by such combustion was constantly and increasingly conveyed from the source of calorification to the liquid contained in the vessel being radiated through the uneven unpolished dark surface of the metal iron in part reflected, in part absorbed, in part transmitted, gradually raising the temperature of the water from normal to boiling point, a rise in temperature expressible as the result of an expenditure of 72 thermal units needed to raise one pound of water from 50 degrees to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. What announced the accomplishment of this rise in temperature? A double falciform ejection of water vapor from under the kettle lid at both sides simultaneously. For what personal purpose could Bloom have applied the water so boiled? To shave himself. What advantages attended shaving by night? A softer beard, a softer brush if intentionally allowed to remain from shave to shave in its agglutinated lather, a softer skin if unexpectedly encountering female acquaintances in remote places at incustomary hours, quiet reflections upon the course of the day, a cleaner sensation when awaking after a fresher sleep, since matutinal noises, premonitions and perturbations, a clattered milk can, a postman's double knock, a paper read, reread while lathering, relathering the same spot, a shock, a shoot, with thought of aught he sought, though fraught with naught, might cause a faster rate of shaving and a nick, on which incision plaster with precision, cut and humected and applied adhered which was to be done. Why did absence of light disturb him less than presence of noise? Because of the surety of the sense of touch in his firm, full, masculine, feminine, passive, active hand. What quality did it, his hand, possess, but with what counteracting influence? The operative surgical quality, but that he was reluctant to shed human blood, even when the end justified the means, preferring in their natural order heliotherapy, psychophysical therapeutics, osteopathic surgery. 
What lay under exposure on the lower, middle, and upper shelves of the kitchen dresser, opened by Bloom? On the lower shelf, five vertical breakfast plates, six horizontal breakfast saucers on which rested inverted breakfast cups, a mustache cup, uninverted, and saucer of crown derby, four white gold-rimmed egg cups. An open chamois purse displaying coins, mostly copper, and a file of aromatic violet comfits. On the middle shelf, a chipped egg cup containing pepper, a drum of table salt, four conglomerated black olives in oleaginous paper, an empty pot of plum trees potted meat, an oval wicker basket bedded with fiber and containing one jersey pear, a half-empty bottle of William Gilby and Company's white invalid port, half disrobed of its swath of coral pink tissue paper, a packet of Epps soluble cocoa, five ounces of Anne Lynch's choice tea at two pence per pound in a crinkled lead paper bag, a cylindrical canister containing the best crystallized lump sugar, two onions, one, the larger Spanish, entire, the other smaller, Irish, bisected with augmented surface and more redolent, a jar of Irish model dairy's cream, a jug of brown crockery containing a nagin and a quart of soured adulterated milk, converted by heat into water, acidulous serum, and semi-solidified curds, which added to the quantity subtracted from Mr. Bloom's and Mrs. Fleming's breakfasts, made one imperial pint of the total quantity originally delivered, two cloves, a half penny and a small dish containing a slice of fresh rib steak. On the upper shelf, a battery of jam jars, empty, of various sizes and proveniences. What attracted his attention lying on the apron of the dresser? Four polygonal fragments of two lacerated scarlet bedding tickets, numbered 8, 87, 88, 6. What reminiscences temporarily corrugated his brow? Reminiscences of coincidences, truth stranger than fiction, pre-indicative of the result of the gold cup flat handicap, the official and definitive result of which he had read in the Evening Telegraph, late pink edition, in the cabin shelter at Butt Bridge. Where had previous intimations of the result affected or projected? been received by him. In Bernard Kiernan's licensed premises 8, 9, and 10 Little Britain Street, in David Burns' licensed premises 14 Duke Street, in O'Connell Street Lower, outside Graham Lemons, where a dark man had placed in his hand a throwaway, subsequently thrown away, advertising Elijah, restorer of the church in Zion, in Lincoln Place, outside the premises of F. W. Sweeney and Company Limited, dispensing chemists when when Frederick M. Bantam Lyons had rapidly and successively requested, perused, and restituted the copy of the current issue of the Freeman's Journal and National Press, which he had been about to throw away, subsequently thrown away. He had proceeded towards the oriental edifice of the Turkish and warm baths, 11 Leinster Street, with the light of inspiration shining in his countenance and bearing in his arms the secret of the race, graven in the language of prediction. What qualifying consideration allayed his perturbations? The difficulties of interpretation since the significance of any event followed its occurrence as variably as the acoustic report followed the electrical discharge and of counter-estimating against an actual loss by failure to interpret the total sum of possible losses proceeding originally from a successful interpretation. His mood? He had not risked. He did not expect. He had not been disappointed. He was satisfied. What satisfied him? To have sustained no positive loss. To have brought a positive gain to others. Light to the Gentiles. How did Bloom prepare a collation for a Gentile? He poured in two teacups, two level spoonfuls, four in all, of Epps soluble cocoa, and proceeded according to the directions for use printed on the label to each adding 
after sufficient time for infusion, the prescribed ingredients for diffusion in the manner and in the quantity prescribed. What supererogatory marks of special hospitality did the host show his guest? Relinquishing his symposiarchal right to the mustache cup of imitation crown derby presented to him by his only daughter, Millicent Millie, he substituted a cup identical with that of his guest and served extraordinarily to his guest and, in reduced measure to himself, the viscous cream ordinarily reserved for the breakfast of his wife, Marian, Molly. Was the guest conscious of, and did he acknowledge these marks of hospitality? His attention was directed to them by his host jocosely, and he accepted them seriously as they drank in joco-serious silence Epps' mass product, the creature Coco. Were there marks of hospitality which he contemplated but suppressed, reserving them for another and for himself on future occasions to complete the act begun? The reparation of a fissure of the length of one and a half inches in the right side of his guest's jacket, a gift to his guest of one of the four ladies' handkerchiefs, even when ascertained to be in presentable condition. Who drank more quickly? Bloom, having the advantage of ten seconds at the initiation and taking from the concave surface of a spoon along the handle of which a steady flow of heat was conducted, three sips to his opponent's one, six to two, nine to three. What cerebration accompanied his frequentative act? concluding by inspection but erroneously that his silent companion was engaged in mental composition, he reflected on the pleasures derived from the literature of instruction rather than of amusement as he himself had applied to the works of William Shakespeare more than once for the solution of difficult problems in imaginary or real life. Had he found their solution? In spite of careful and repeated reading of certain classical passages, aided by a glossary, he had derived imperfect conviction from the text, the answers not bearing in all points. What lines concluded his first piece of original verse written by him, potential poet at the age of 11 in 1877, on the occasion of the offering of three prizes of ten pence, five pence, and two and six respectively for competition by the shamrock, a weekly newspaper. An ambition to squint at my verses in print makes me hope that for these you'll find room. If you so condense, then please place at the end the name of yours truly, L. Bloom. Did he find force separating forces between his temporary guest and him? Name, age, race, creed. What anagrams had he made on his name in youth? Leopold Bloom, El Podbomol, Maldo Bloom, Balo P. Doom, Old Olebo M.P. What acrostic upon the abbreviation of his first name had he, kinetic poet, sent to Miss Marion Molly Tweedy on the 14th February 1888? Poets oft have sung in rhyme, of music sweet their praise divine. Let them hymn it nine times nine, dearer far than song or wine. You are mine, the world is mine. What had prevented him from completing a topical song, music by R.G. Johnson, on the events of the past or fixtures for the actual years entitled If Brian Boru Could But Come Back and See Old Dublin Now, commissioned by Michael Gunn, lessee of the Gaiety Theatre, 4647, 4849 South King Street, and to be introduced into the sixth scene, The Valley of Diamonds, of the second edition, 30 January 1893, of the grand annual Christmas pantomime Sinbad the Sailor, produced by R. Shelton, 26 December 1892, written by Greenleaf Whittier, scenery by George A. Jackson and Cecil Hicks, costumes by Mrs. and Miss Whelan, under the personal supervision of Mrs. Michael Gunn, ballets by Jesse Noir, Harlequinade by Thomas Otto, and sung by Nellie Bouveriste, principal girl. Firstly, 
oscillation between events of imperial and of local interest, the anticipated Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria, born 1820, exceeded 1837, and the post-anticipated opening of the new municipal fish market. Secondly, apprehension of opposition from extreme circles on the questions of the respective visits of their royal highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of York, real, and of his majesty, King Brian Boru, imaginary. Thirdly, a conflict between professional etiquette and professional emulation concerning the recent erections at the Grand Lyric Hall on Burr Quay and the Theatre Royal in Horkin Street. Fourthly, distraction resulting from compassion for Nelly Bouverie's non-intellectual, non-political, non-topical expression of countenance and concupiscence caused by Nelly Bouverie's revelations of white articles of non-intellectual, non-political, non-topical underclothing, while she, Nelly Bouverie, was in the articles. Fifthly, the difficulty of the selection of appropriate music and humorous allusions from everybody's book of jokes... 1,000 pages and a laugh in every one. Sixthly, the rhymes, homophonous and cacophonous, associated with the names of the new Lord Mayor, Daniel Tallon, the new High Sheriff, Thomas Pyle, and the new Solicitor General, Dunbar Plunkett Barton. What relation existed between their ages? Sixteen years before, in 1888, when Bloom was of Stephen's present age, Stephen was six. Sixteen years after, in 1920, when Stephen would be of Bloom's present age, Bloom would be 54. In 1936, when Bloom would be 70 and Stephen 54, their ages initially in the ratio of 16 to 0 would be uh, 17 and a half to 13 and a half, the proportion increasing and the disparity diminishing according as arbitrary future years were added. For if the proportion existing in 1883 had continued immutable, conceiving that to be possible, till then, 1904, when Stephen was 22, Bloom would be 374, and in 1920, when Stephen would be 38, a Bloom then was, Bloom would be 646, while in 1952, when Stephen would have attained the maximum post Luvian age of 70, Bloom being 1190 years alive, having been born in the year 714, would have surpassed by 221 years the maximum antediluvian age, that of Methuselah, 969 years. Well, if Stephen would continue to live, would he attain that age in the year 3072 AD, Bloom would have been obliged to have been alive 83,300 years, having been obliged to have been born in the year 81,396 BC. What events might nullify these calculations? The cessation of existence of both or either, the inauguration of a new era of, or calendar, the annihilation of the world and consequent extermination of the human species, inevitable but mm, impredictable. How many previous encounters proved their pre-existing acquaintance? Two. The first in the lilac garden of Matthew Dillon's house, Medina Villa Kimmage Road, Round Town, in 1887, in the company of Stephen's mother, Stephen being then of the age of five and reluctant to give his hand in salutation. The second in the coffee room of Breslin's Hotel on a rainy Sunday, in the January of 1892, in the company of Stephen's father and Stephen's grand uncle, Stephen being then five years older. Did Bloom accept the invitation to dinner given then by the son and afterwards seconded by the father? Very gratefully, with grateful appreciation, with sincere appreciative gratitude, in appreciative grateful sincerity of regret, he declined. Did their conversation on the subject of these reminiscences reveal a, a third connecting link between them? Mrs. Riordan Dante, a widow of independent means, had resided in the house of Stephen's parents from 1 September 1888 to 29 December 1891, and had also resided during the years 1892, 1893, and 1894 in the City Arms Hotel owned by Elizabeth O'Dowd of 54 Prussia Street, where, during parts of the years 1893 and 1894, she had been a constant informant of Bloom 
who resided also in the same hotel, being at that time a clerk in the employment of Joseph Coff of Five Smithfield for the superintendence of sales in the adjacent Dublin cattle market on the North Circular Road. Had he performed any special corporal work of mercy for her? He had sometimes propelled her on warm summer evenings, an infirm widow of independent if limited means, in her convalescent bath chair, with slow revolutions of its wheels as far as the corner of the North Circular Road, opposite Mr. Gavin Lowe's place of business where she had remained for a certain time, scanning through his one-lensed binocular field glasses, unrecognizable citizens on tram cars, roadster bicycles equipped with inflated pneumatic tires, hackney carriages, tandems, private and hired landaus, dog carts, pony traps, and brakes passing from the city to the Phoenix Park and vice versa. Why could he then support that his vigil with the greater equanimity? because in middle youth he had often sat observing through a rondel of bossed glass of a multicolored plain the spectacle offered with continual changes of the thoroughfare without pedestrians, quadrupeds, velocipedes, vehicles passing slowly, quickly, evenly, round and round and round the rim of a round and round precipitous globe. What distinct different memories had each of her now, eight years deceased? The older, her bezique cards and counters, her sky terrier, her suppositious wealth, her lapses of responsiveness and incipient cotteral deafness. The younger, her lamp of colza oil before the statue of the Immaculate Conception, her green and maroon brushes for Charles Stuart Parnell and for Michael Davitt, her tissue papers. Were there no means still remaining to him to achieve the rejuvenation which these reminiscences divulged to a younger companion rendered the more desirable? The indoor exercises, formerly intermittently practiced, subsequently abandoned, prescribed in Eugene Sandow's physical strength and how to obtain it, which, designed particularly for commercial men engaged in sedentary occupations, were to be made with mental concentration in front of a mirror so as to bring into play the various families of muscles and produce successively a pleasant rigidity, a more pleasant relaxation, and a more pleasant repristination of juvenile agility. Had any special agility been his? Though ring weight lifting had been beyond his strength and the full circle gyration beyond his courage, yet as a high school scholar he had excelled in his stable and protracted execution of the half-lever movement on the parallel bars in consequence of his abnormally developed abdominal muscles. Did either openly allude to their racial difference? Neither. What reduced to their simplest reciprocal form were Bloom's thoughts about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom, and about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom's thoughts about Stephen. He thought that he thought that he was a Jew, whereas he knew that he knew that he knew that he was not. What the enclosures of reticence removed were their respective parentages. Bloom, only born male, transubstantial heir of Rudolf Virag, subsequently Rudolf Bloom, of Zombethli, Vienna, Budapest, Milan, London, and Dublin, and of Ellen Higgins, second daughter of Julius Higgins, born Carolee, and Fanny Higgins, born Hegarty, Stephen, eldest surviving male, consubstantial heir of Simon Dedalus of Cork and Dublin, and of Mary, daughter of Richard and Christina Goulding, born Greer. Had Bloom and Stephen been baptized, and where and by whom, cleric or layman? Bloom, three times, by the Reverend Mr. Gimel Justin, M.A., alone in the Protestant Church of St. Nicholas without, Coom by James O'Connor, Philip Gilligan and James Fitzpatrick, together under a pump in the village of Swords, and by the Reverend Charles Malone, C.C., in the Church of the Three Patrons, Rathgar. Stephen once, by the Reverend Charles Malone, C.C., alone in the Church of the Three Patrons, Rathgar. Did they find their educational career similar? 
Substituting Stephen for Bloom Stoom would have passed successively through a dame school and the high school. Substituting Bloom for Stephen Bleven would have passed successively through the preparatory, junior, middle, and senior grades of the intermediate and through the matriculation, first arts, second arts, and arts degree courses of the Royal University. Why did Bloom refrain from stating that he had frequented the University of Life? Because of his fluctuating incertitude as to whether this observation had or had not already been made by him to Stephen, or by Stephen to him. What two temperaments did they individually represent? The scientific, the artistic. What proofs did Bloom adduce to prove that his tendency was towards applied rather than towards pure science? Certain possible inventions of which he had cogitated when reclining in a state of supine repletion to aid digestion, stimulated by his appreciation of the importance of inventions now common but once revolutionary, for example, the aeronautic parachute, the reflecting telescope, the spiral corkscrew, the safety pin, the mineral water siphon, the canal lock with winch and sluice, the suction pump. Were these inventions principally intended for an improved scheme of kindergarten? Yes, rendering obsolete pop guns, elastic air bladders, games of hazard catapults. They comprised astronomical kaleidoscopes exhibiting the twelve constellations of the zodiac, from Aries to Pisces, miniature mechanical orreries, arithmetical gelatin lozenges, geometrical to correspond with zoological biscuits, globe map playing balls, historically costumed dolls. What also stimulated him in his cogitations? The financial success achieved by Ephraim Marx and Charles A. James, the former by his 1D Bazaar at 42 George's Street South, the latter at his 6.5D Shop and World's Fancy Fair and Waxwork Exhibition at 30 Henry Street. Admission, 2D, Children, 1D, and the infinite possibilities hitherto unexploited of the modern art of advertisement, if condensed in trilateral, mono-ideal symbols, vertically of maximum visibility, divined, horizontally of maximum legibility, deciphered, and of magnetizing efficacy to arrest involuntary attention, to interest, to convince, to decide. Such as K-11 Kinos, 11 Pence Trousers, House of Keys, Alexander J. Keyes. Such as not. Look at this long candle. Calculate when it burns out, and you receive gratis one pair of our special non-compo boots, guaranteed one candle power. Address Barclay and Cook, 18 Talbot Street. Basilical, insect powder, very best, boot blacking. You want it. Combined pocket two-blade pen knife with corkscrew, nail file, and pipe cleaner. Such as never? What is home without plum tree spotted meat? Incomplete. With it an abode of bliss, manufactured by George Plumtree, 23 Merchants Key, Dublin, put up in four-ounce pots and inserted by Councillor Joseph P. Ninetti, M.P. Rotunda Ward, 19 Hardwick Street, under the obituary notices and anniversaries of deceases. The name on the label is Plumtree. A plum tree in a meat pot. Registered trademark. Beware of imitations. Pete Mott, Trumpley, Mootpat, Plamtru. Which example did he adduce to induce Stephen to deduce that originality, though producing its own reward does not invariably conduce to success? His own ideated and rejected project of an illuminated show cart, drawn by a beast of burden in which two smartly dressed girls were to be seated engaged in riding. What suggested scene was then constructed by Stephen? Solitary hotel in Mountain Pass, autumn, twilight, fire lit. 
In dark corner, young man seated. Young woman enters, restless, solitary. She sits. She goes to the window. She stands. She sits. Twilight. She thinks. On solitary hotel paper, she writes. She thinks. She writes. She sighs. Wheels and hoofs. She hurries out. He comes from the dark corner. He seizes solitary paper. He holds it towards fire. Twilight. He reads. Solitary. What? In sloping upright and back hands, Queen's Hotel, Queen's Hotel, Queen's Hotel, Queen's Hotel. What suggested scene was then reconstructed by Bloom? The Queen's Hotel, Ennis County Clare, where Rudolph Bloom, Rudolph Virag, died on the evening of the 27th, June 1886, at some hour unstated, in consequence of an overdose of monkshood, aconite, self-administered in the form of neuralgic liniment composed of two parts of aconite liniment to one of chloroform liniment purchased by him at 10.20 a.m. on the morning of 27 June 1886 at the Medical Hall of Francis Dennehy, 17 Church Street, Ennis. After having, though not in consequence of having, purchased at 3.15 p.m. on the afternoon of 27 June 1886 a new boater straw hat, extra smart, after having, though not in consequence of having, purchased at the hour and in the place aforesaid the toxin aforesaid, at the General Drapery Store of James Cullen, 4 Main Street, Ennis. Did he attribute this homonymity to information or coincidence or intuition? Coincidence. Did he depict the scene verbally for his guest to see? He preferred himself to see another's face and listen to another's words by which potential narration was realized and kinetic temperament relieved. Did he see only a second coincidence in the second scene narrated to him, described by the narrator as Pisgah's sight of Palestine or the parable of the plums? It, with the preceding scene and with others unnarrated, but existent by implication, to which add essays on various subjects or moral apothegms, e.g. my favorite hero or procrastination is the thief of time, composed during school years, seem to him to contain in itself and in conjunction with the personal equation certain possibilities of financial, social, personal, and sexual success, whether specifically collected and selected as model pedagogic themes of cent per cent merit for the use of preparatory and junior grade students or contributed in printed form following the precedent of Philip Beaufoy or Dr. Dick or Hevelin Studies in Blue to a publication of certain circulation and solvency or employed verbally as intellectual stimulation for sympathetic auditors tacitly appreciative of successive narrative and confidently augurative of successful achievement during the increasingly longer nights gradually following the summer solstice on the day but three following. Vide le set, Tuesday, 21 June, S. Aloysius Gonzaga, sunrise, 3.33 a.m., sunset, 8.29 p.m.